Well, look how many things throughout history that the government and, ma and many major medical associations have said, okay, uh, lead, one of the deadliest uh, compounds, you know, elements known to man, uh, lead, they said, unleaded ga or leaded yeah. gasoline, leaded paint was okay. Well, no, it isn't, mm -hmm. okay? Asbestos, tobacco, DDT, DES, thalidomide, you go right down the line, all of these substances that were said to have been okay, no they weren't. And fluoride is the same thing. This is Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we have two guests. We have Rick North, who is uh, formerly with uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility here in Portland and is now on the Executive Committee of Clean Water Portland. And our second guest, guest is Kelly Barnes, who is also on the Executive Committee of Clean Water Portland. So welcome to the show. Thank okay. you. Good. And so what we want to talk about today is the uh, measure which will be on the ballot in May uh, here in Portland with regard to floor, floor di floor daddy? <laughs> <laughs> fluoridating our Portland drinking water. Right. And so first of all, let me, let me just ask how you both got involved with this issue. Well, for me, I became involved uh, quite a few years ago when I was researching the topic for my son of fluoridation tablets. And as a mother and as a physical therapist, I'm a healthcare mm -hmm. provider, I began to look into the research of fluoridation. And to be honest, I went in with the premise that it would be a good thing to do. And after looking at the research, was appalled at what I found. And not only do I now not support water fluoridation, I also don't support the use of using the tablets. Mm, okay, great, Rick. And <coughs> I was in favor of fluoridation too for most of my life until about five years ago. I got a call from a friend of mine saying, you know, would you look at the science of fluoridation? And I, at that time, was working for Physicians for Social Responsibility, and most of my career had been with the American Cancer Society. I was the former director and state director here. So I'm not a doctor or a scientist. Uh, I just worked with them most of my life, and, and she knew this. So I said, sure, I, you know, I'll look at it. And I was both uh, amazed and very, very concerned. And just by reading the science and a number of books on the history of this, and I came to the conclusion very readily that uh, water fluoridation, the chemicals used for water fluoridation, are not safe, not effective, and uh, not right for Portland uh, to use these chemicals to, uh, this is some of the, I got a picture here, this is, this is Bull Run. This is some of the you know, best, purest water in the whole world. And this is the chemical, fluorosilicic acid, that they use for it. And uh, we just don't, you know, this is not a good thing to do. Okay. All right. And so <coughs> let, let, let's talk for a few minutes about why we are voting on this and also the history of how we have voted in the past on the same issue. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can. You want to pick that yeah. Up? Uh, Portland has voted three times on this, uh, always voting it down. However, the last time was in 1980, so it was quite a while ago. Uh, Portland City Council decided uh, to fluoridate. And this came as a surprise to just about all of us, but uh, a coalition of uh, organizations uh, were meeting very quietly with Portland City Council members to, to fluoridate. And in September, they voted to fluoridate. We had a choice. Um, we, we had 30 days to get enough signatures, about 20,000 valid ones, to trigger a referendum that would bring this to a vote, to put a halt to fluoridation, bring it to a vote. Uh, amazingly, I, I, an incredible group of people, most of whom did not even know each other when this started, in 30 days came together and put together an incredible campaign. We got over 43,000 signatures total. In, in how many days? In 30, Less actually 29 30. days. And 29, 29 days, days we right. delivered them one day early. Right. We got so many. And uh, that triggered the referendum. So that is coming up. It'll be a vote uh, up or down on fluoridation. And that will be May 21st of this year. Okay. You know, and here's the thing that I think is important to consider. With that many signatures, citizens were really upset about this political process. And they're also upset that we are changing 
you know, potentially the, the idea of adding an industrial byproduct, a waste byproduct to Bull Run's water in Portland, that doesn't sit very well because we have an amazingly clean source of water. And not only is it important to know that fluoride is not fluoride is not fluoride, this industrial byproduct, when you actually do testing, 43% of it has been found to have arsenic. And arsenic at any level is a known carcinogen. And the EPA public health goals for arsenic are zero. And what's also interesting about that is when the, the phosphate fertilizer industry takes the product and they take it out of their scrub brushes, they're not allowed by law to release it into our air or water. It has to actually be taken out of the brushes. But they can recycle it, make it into this acid form, and use it for fluoridation chemicals that they're putting into our water. And a lot of citizens don't know that. It's really an important piece of the discussion. OK. And, and so where does it come from? You're t talking about taking it out of scrub brushes. What? Right. Well, it comes from the phosphate fertilizer <coughs> industry. There is a, a very complex process where it breaks down. But the end result is they're actually taking it from their industrial byproduct, from their scrub brushes, from their waste recycled scrub brushes. They dilute it down into an acid form that's then given to municipal bodies for the process of fluoridation. 90% of the United States fluoridation chemicals are hydrofacilic acid. And that's not the same as fluoride that's in toothpaste. It has no regulation from the FDA. And it's shown in 43% of the samples to have arsenic in it. It's co-contaminated. Oh, okay, but the fluoride that's in toothpaste does not have arsenic in it, or, or it's a different it's a different grade of fluoride. It's a different chemical, and it has different regulations. The FDA has no jurisdiction over fluoridation chemicals placed in water. Uh, and does anybody have? It's a great question. Um, the FDA does not. The EPA does not have jurisdiction. It's actually self-regulated by voluntary standards of a group called NSF. Okay, that's always scary. So no <laughs> no one's and, and no one shop. assumes liability over this product. Mm -hmm. Not the FDA, not the EPA, not the NSF, and not the individual manufacturers. This product, uh, they none of them will assume li uh, liability, responsibility for its safety. Okay, uh, and uh, th they they have a choice of of having responsibility for it. Well, I think some of the issue in regards to the source of fluoride is, is somewhat cost-oriented as well. Hydrofacilic acid is not as expensive as some other grades of fluoride. However, really the topic at hand, the point at hand, is what is Portland proposing for our water? And we know from the Portland Water Bureau that they're proposing to use hydrofacilic acid. We know the source of it. No one's denying that it's an industrial byproduct. We know it's co-contaminated with arsenic and 43%. We know that we love Bull Run and we have a great source of water. So that's one very important question in this discussion. The other piece that I think is important is that science is changing. I'm a physical therapist. It takes a long time for policy to change, but science changes over time, and it takes a long time to get our white coat organizations on board. But new science is indicating that we need to be more thoughtful about this discussion for many reasons. And Rick can talk about this in more detail, but some of those are endocrine, some of those are bone cancers, and some of those are other risks systemically to our bodies that haven't been discussed before. Do, do you want to dive into that? Yeah, I mean, just like, uh, just to give you an example. Now, the pro-fluoride people will say, oh, this has been going on for you know, 40, 50 years, and it's always been safe and effective and all this. Well, take a look at the um, Department of Health and Human Services recommendations for how high you should fluoridate the water. Uh, up until 2011, they were saying it should be between 0.7 and 1.2 parts per million. You fluoridate in that, in that range, and it's perfectly safe, no problem whatsoever. Okay. Well, in 2011, they changed their mind. They said, well, no, we better bring that down. You should make it 0.7, uh, that's it. You know? So here's something they've been saying for decades. Mm -hmm. Saying, no, well, we need to bring that down. And you know, our point is, wait a minute, you know, you, you need to take a look at this. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of evidence out there that even at point seven, there are real serious questions whether this is safe. And you're talking about the history and how long it takes. Um, take a look at just, you know, the, the government. This is coming from the federal government, this push for fluoridation, you know, specifically the CDC, the Oral Health Division and the CDC. The CDC is. Oh, I'm sorry, the Centers for Disease Control. Okay. And the American Dental Associates, Association. Those are the two main drivers of this. And, you know, I think, well, the government, this is what I used to think. 
Mm -hmm. The government says it's okay. They're there major, to protect us. Some major medical associations say it's okay. It must be okay, right? Well, look how many things throughout history that the government and, ma and many major medical associations have said okay. Lead, one of the deadliest uh, compounds, you know, elements known to man. Uh, lead, they said, unleaded ga or leaded yeah. gasoline, leaded paint was okay. Well, no, it isn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, asbestos, tobacco, DDT, DES, thalidomide. You go right down the line. All of these substances that were said to have been okay, no, they weren't. And fluoride is the same thing. This is a house of cards. And this house of cards, as more and more scientific evidence comes out against it, it's going to fall. And you know, just to step back and think about it for a moment, you know, there was a, a large, the EPA asked the National Academy of Science to do a study in 2006. So they did. They started, you know, looking, and, and Rick can speak about this in more detail, but they looked at fluoridation concerns systemically as well as prevention of tooth decay. And they really came out of that study and said, hey, we have some concerns and we want further research. Some of our concerns include risk for, for cancer, some of them concern endocrine disease, such as hypothyroid, and different fractures, different risk for fractures. But the relevance of that is then the Department of Health and Human Services says, OK, so our concentration of all these decades of potentially as high as 1.2 you know, now we're saying, all right, we want to reduce that by 40% because we're concerned about the systemic health of our population and whether the therapeutic margin of how it's helping cavities is smaller than we thought. So that's a major concern for a federal organization to now make a new recommendation decades later based on the wake of this new science that's coming out. Yeah. And, and then not only would uh, Oregonians or Portlanders begin in fluoride, which they would be adding to their to the water, but there is naturally occurring fluoride also. A very small amount in Bull Run, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and not not anything that's of any concern. It's a very small amount. Yeah. I okay. believe it's 0.1, and it's a different source of fluoride. Oh, okay. So, but but does this this uh, you know, if we say that a certain level is safe for adding to the water and then you add an additional amount which is well, naturally occurring. It brings in a great question of total fluoride exposure. Okay. That's what right? I'm trying to say, thank so, you. So, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a big discussion about this and there's a video that we'll be talking about, but there's one point that's really important about that. We are exposed to fluoride in many different forms and many different chemical variants. And when you look at statistics from the CDC, looking at one of the concerns that our Amer American Dental Association has about fluoridation chemicals used in water, and our policy is that of fluorosis. Fluorosis is a fluorine toxicity, and it shows in discoloration of the teeth in any form, mild, moderate, or severe. The concern about this is it's a sign of fluorine poisoning or toxicity. So the CDC studies show that 12 to 15 percent, or excuse me, 41 percent of our teens between the age of 12 to 15 have fluorosis. This is a recent study. This is information from the CDC. We're exposed in pesticides. We're exposed in sodas and phosphate syrups. We're exposed in our cereal. You name it, we are exposed and taken in fluoride at large amounts already. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh, you mentioned the video. So why don't we go ahead and watch the video, uh, which takes about five minutes. Yeah, and that's great because one of the big concerns um, and one of the main talking points that the pro-fluoride fluoride people have said is, well, this is good for the poor. This is good for minorities. Well, we absolutely take issue with that. No, it isn't. Okay. And we got a little video here. Uh, this is Dr. Yolanda White, who is a pediatrician. Uh, and she is working uh, all over the country on this to say, you know, fluoridation is not safe. And it's not effective. And we'd like to, you know, she's a great spokesperson, and we'd like to just give a, a quick uh, clip for yeah. Dr. White. All right, let's watch the clip. Hi, I'm Dr. Yolanda White. I'm a primary care pediatrician who no longer supports water fluoridation. Pediatricians like myself are taught to pay very close attention to the proper weight-based dosage for each drug and to make sure that our patients do not receive more of a drug than is necessary or safe. But unfortunately, when it comes to fluoride, this basic precaution is not being followed. In fact, the dose of fluoride 
that's supposedly effective in preventing dental cavities is very close to the dose that, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, can cause harm for some children. So it has a very narrow therapeutic window. Since children now receive fluoride from so many different sources, it's virtually impossible for a doctor to determine exactly how much fluoride each child is actually getting. And if you can't determine the amount of fluoride, then you can't determine the dose. And if you can't determine the dose of fluoride, then you can't determine safety. As a pediatrician, I am deeply concerned that fluoride is not good for babies and that they are at risk for harmful side effects. The most clearly visible side effect is dental fluorosis, a permanent staining of the teeth caused by fluoride's interference with normal tooth development. There's a significant number of children in the United States who now have some form of dental fluorosis. According to the Centers for Disease Control, dental fluorosis affects 41% of teenagers. That's millions of children who now have a visible form of chronic fluoride toxicity. As a pediatrician, I'm concerned that fluoride could also affect tissues and organs that are not visible, like the bones, the thyroid, and the brain. My concern is based in part on a large body of research finding that modestly elevated levels of fluoride can reduce a child's intelligence, especially if there's a deficient intake of iodine. Children are disproportionately affected by fluoride for several key reasons. They receive a greater fluoride dose per body weight when compared to adults. They have far more fluoride incorporated into their skeleton than adults. They have a lower kidney excretion of fluoride into their urine, meaning more fluoride gets reabsorbed back into their bloodstream where it can bioaccumulate. And their developing brains are more susceptible to fluoride's toxicity. This can affect their educational achievement. And these unique characteristics of children can no longer be ignored. I'm also concerned by research findings showing that dental fluorosis is higher in the black community, even the more severe forms, where the teeth can start to erode and develop black and brown stains. This health disparity and environmental injustice will need to be addressed. Even though federal agencies recommended lowering fluoride concentration in water down to 0.7 parts per million, that reduction is slow to implement in each jurisdiction, and frankly, it's not enough. Over-the-counter water filters can't remove the fluoride. So my heart goes out to pregnant women, seniors, those with kidney, thyroid, and other health conditions who can't afford a water purification process to remove the fluoride. They shouldn't even be put in this position. Because water is for everyone, but fluoride is not. Therefore, it's my professional recommendation that we discontinue water fluoridation in the United States. I know I don't want to drink fluoridated water, and I commend residents of Portland, Oregon for fighting hard for the right to keep fluoride out of their water. And also states like New Hampshire and cities like Milwaukee for including infant advisories on their water bills. This past May, New York City held their first children's anti-fluoride rally. Sooner or later, you too will have to make some very important decisions about fluoride. And so it's better to be safe and responsible now so we won't have to pay for it later. It's all about prevention. Thank you. So let's talk about some of the points that she made. <coughs> One, the, the health uh, effects of, of fluoride, uh, particularly in children, and, um, and, and, well, dentists particularly are talking about how uh, minority children, in particular, are hurt by not having fluoride in their water because they have uh, much higher rates of, of dental problems than the rest of us? Yeah, I can, uh, it's interesting, you're, you're on to effectiveness there. There are two questions come up, you know, safety and effectiveness. Uh, the story of fluoridation, 80 to 90 percent of it is really about safety, about what is going on in all of your body. And then the 10 or 20 percent is this, the teeth, okay, and they are referring to the teeth. There all kinds of questions on the effectiveness. Uh, in terms of effectiveness, uh, there, 
basically we're talking about the biggest study uh, done was flori fluoridation 0.62 surfaces per kid per childhood less cavities that's not much uh, and many studies since then have shown essentially no significant change whatsoever city after city in the in the country that are fluoridated are saying they're having the same dental problems that Portland, which isn't. So we do not want to minimize the seriousness of uh, cavities and dental problems at all. I mean, this, this is serious, and nobody wants kids to have cavities, or adults either, for that matter. The question is, though, is fluoridation, you know, putting this uh, chemical into our water, is that the best way to deal with this? Uh, it, you know, with all these other health problems that are associated with it, mm -hmm. we say absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you bring up a great point. I mean, this is being proposed to help those children in need due to high risk of dental decay. And it is true statistically that children of color are more at risk. I, I would argue if you look at those statistics, it becomes more of an issue of dental access and that there are better alternatives. And especially when Portland on non-fluoridated water, as Rick discussed, is already you know, doing the top 15th of the nation when you look at CDC data. So those statistics are not being put out in the media. Secondly, when it comes to equity in, in this particular issue, and Dr. White actually touched upon it, you know, children of color, black American children, are more at risk for the moderate and severe forms of fluorosis, according to the CDC, two to one compared to children who are white. And Latino children are one and a half to one. That is a big deal, and that does not seem to me to be equitable to be promoting this in communities of color as an answer for helping you know, dental hygiene and, and not having decay when it actually systemically is hurting those children who are on these policies. Secondly, I would argue that you know, children who are six months or younger, it's said by the American Academy of Pediatrics, they should not be on fluoridated water for their formula. So how is it equitable for a single mother in Portland to even know, one, that her child should not be on fluoridated water when making formula? She has to go out to the grocery store and buy a now Gerber's bottle of non-fluoridated water if Bull Run becomes fluoridated with fluorine chemicals. How is that equitable for a single mom to need to do that when we already have a great source of water? And if you go to Gerber's website, which I find interesting, it says Gerber Pure Water is fluoride-free choice because babies less than six months don't need fluoride. I mean, the point is the American Academy of Pediatrics is saying this is harmful to children under six months. This is harmful for our teens who already have fluorosis. And we need to be looking at other better alternatives. Okay. All right. And are, are there better alternatives? Oh, absolutely. Uh, this is just a, a little more show and tell here. We've got um, a couple of toothpastes. And I don't know if people realize this. Regular toothpaste, and this is even a toothpaste for kids, which is fluoridated. But if you look at your toothpaste tube, it's going to have this warning on it. It says, keep out of reach of children under six years of age. If more than used for brushing is accidentally swallowed, get medical help or contact a poison control center right away. And what they recommend for brushing is a pea size. Saying if you swallow more than a pea size amount of toothpaste, get medical help or call a poison control center. This will give you some idea of the toxicity of fluoride. And again, you know, people more and more are realizing this and understanding it. And here, for instance, is uh, this is a Colgate. Here's a baby Origel tooth and gum cleanser, uh, safe if swallowed, fluoride free. So people are realizing this, and they are taking appropriate actions to protect their kids. Mm -hmm. And I would just say in response to your question, there are definitely better solutions. There is funding in Multnomah County and Portland for dental access. There are school programs set up and city and county programs set up where children can get topical fluoride, which is how the CDC actually supports the program of fluoridation now, that it's actually better used topically than systemically. And there's also sealant programs, and, and this is interesting to mention because Washington <laughs> State, that supposedly has better statistics on dental decay than the state of Oregon, actually uses more 
sealants. It prevents future dental decay when they use sealants on the molars. And I just think in summary, when you take a step back and look at the big picture of Portland, one, we're doing well in the nation compared to other states. We're top 15th looking at dental decay, and we're on non-fluoridated water. Our water is pure and clean. We have a great water source. Why do we want to use industrial byproducts, co-contaminate it with arsenic at any level in our water? And then take another step back and say, hey, there's new science. This is a program that's been going on for decades. Let's look at the new science. The National Academy of Science is saying we need to look at this further. There's new federal recommendations to lower concentration based on systemic concern of fluorosis. Why are we in Portland pushing this along on a fast track? It does not make sense. Okay, good. Well, that, that is an excellent summary. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, I, I will ask, what, where can people go to get more information on this issue? Two really good websites. Uh, I like to say, anyway, uh, uh -huh. our, ours, our, our local one, which is uh, cleanwaterportland.org. Okay. And then the Fluoride Alert Network, uh, or Fluoride Action Network, excuse me, but fluoridealert.org. This is an incredibly, uh, incredible website. Uh, for one, it's in lay language, so anybody can understand it. You don't have to be a scientist or a physician to understand it. Uh, great information on all kinds of things. but. If you are one of those geeky people that likes to really get into the science, it's got all kinds of scientific documentation. So okay. that's a great place to go. Excellent. Thank you for being here, Rick. Thank you, Dave. Kelly, thank you. Thank you. Good. So we've been talking with Rick North and Kelly Barnes, both on the executive committee of Clean Water Portland, talking about fluoridation of Portland's water and why that's a bad idea. Uh, we have all heard politicians and pundits say that we Americans have the best health care system in the world. If, that's not, if that is true, then how do you explain these facts? America has a higher infant mortality rate than most of the world's industrialized nations. America ranks 50th in the world in life expectancy. Medical debt contributes to over 50 percent, excuse me, over 46 percent of all personal uh, bankruptcies and approximately 44,000 deaths annually in America result from lack of health insurance. Uh, yet the World Health Organization ranked the U.S. health system as the highest in cost in the world. No, we don't have the best system. We have the most expensive system. We need to change that and we need to improve it. We need to do that right now. We need to recognize that health care uh, is a human right and we need to start right now here in Oregon. If you agree, I would recommend that you go down to Salem, Oregon on February 4th for uh, the opening day of the 2013 session of the Oregon Legislature for a rally and lobby day sponsored by Healthcare for All Oregon, uh, advocating for healthcare as a human right, healthcare which is universal and which is affordable. Uh, that will start at, the rally starts at 11.30 and the march starts at 10.30. Uh, remember that health care needs to, needs to allow everybody in and leave nobody out. I want to thank our crew today for getting us on the air. Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, and Tom Thomas. And I want to thank the audience for watching and I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>